Now we're going to move on to assessment of the hip. So you've already done your history, so you have a pretty good idea of the key things you want to focus on for your physical exam. This is a generic exam going through a strategy of evaluating the hip using hip nurse. Don't think you can't ask questions though because the history is done. I would encourage you to strongly continue to ask questions as new information presents itself throughout the exam. Start your exam with an introductory statement. I'm going to be performing a hands-on assessment. If anything is painful or uncomfortable, please let me know right away and don't let me do anything that will cause you further injury. Okay. A little bit of pain and discomfort is okay and we're kind of looking for that, but if it's too much, you have to tell me right away. Okay, sounds okay. good. All right. Why do you do that? You develop trust and rapport with your patient and you give them an outline of what's going to be happening for the rest of the exam. So it's fundamental that we have that as our starting point. So for inspection of the hip, a couple of key things to get is you could go ahead and start with a basic postural assessment. So the patient stands up and you can just observe how they stand. Maybe they have an antalgic gait. You watch how they walked in, they had a bit of a limp, some kind of lower body injury. Maybe perfect, Carly, the way you did that. She stands off to one side where she only puts weight on this side and doesn't want to put weight in the opposite hip. Okay? You'd also go ahead and observe, is the internal or external rotation, is there more genu valgus, uh, genu varum, where the foot, feet are turned in or out, anything like that. Check those fallen arches because they can definitely influence hip pain and pathology. Okay? And you also might want to look at just general muscle mass. Okay? Look at the shape of the quads as they come down over top of the greater trochanters and iliac crests. You want to check iliac crest height from one side to the other and while you're there you might as well do ASISs. Now you'll notice that I'm on my knees. Why am I on my knees? Because I need to be at eye level to see what I'm looking at here. Okay? All right. The further you get away from that, the more distorted the shot actually gets and you don't get a very specific uh, view of what's going on. So that'll be my anterior view. We'll have her turn to the side. A couple of key things that I want to do here when I'm looking for a side posture is I want to look at the shape of the knees themselves. I want to look at the shape of the pelvis, the orientation of the pelvis, so anterior, posterior, pelvic tilt. You also want to check, yeah, whether whether she's even back or, you know, back forward like this. Maybe she has tight hip flexors. Maybe she's back more like this, excessive gluteal engagement or something like that. Hyperlordosis, hypolordosis. Do this with the patient barefoot, okay? High heels can really throw this off, especially if the person has been wearing high heels for many, many years. It can really change the mechanics and function of their spine and their, into the hip region, okay? Have them spin another 90 degrees. And from this side, you're looking at key things again. Just gonna palpate your iliac crests. Just a good tip in general, the patient doesn't really know what you're doing, and if all of a sudden you just grab them like this, it can be a little bit startling and jar them a little bit. So again, just let them know, I'm just gonna put my hands over top of your hips. I just wanna compare heights from side to side. So iliac crests, PSIS, maybe down to the midline of the sacrum, see where you are there. Look at the shape of the glutes, gluteal fold height, is it level? Look at the knees, and then back down into the foot. Realistically, for a detailed postural assessment, I would actually go the other way around. Start at the feet and work your way up. Because even if she has a fallen arch, that fallen arch takes that leg and internally rotates it, creates more genu valgus at the knee, internally rotates the hip, puts a little bit more pressure over top of the short lateral rotators. So there's a lot of changes that happen that you would miss in a hip pathology if you didn't look back at the foot. So please go back to the feet for these ones. Okay? So that's inspection. The next thing is palpation. This is one of the rare examples, examples where I would say palpation should be done in a supine position. All right. What I would do though is I would usually wait before I put them supine. I'd want to get my active range of motion out of the way. So to start with, I'll just go to active range of motion, follow the actions that I do. If it's uncomfortable, let me know right away and try and go as far as possible. Okay. okay? So she's going to bring her leg all the way up and then back down. How's that? Good. Okay. Other side. Okay. Key thing, and she's doing it automatically, is I would put a table or have the patient beside the wall so they can stabilize themselves. Really crucial. Let's go ahead and do those again, but this time with your knee flexed. When you do it with your knee flexed, what are we taking out of the picture? Hamstrings. Hamstrings are out of the picture. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. And then this way, all the way up. Yeah. So we can already tell we're going to spend a little bit of time working on this patient's hamstrings, but that's fine. So the next motion is going to be abduction. So I'll take you out to the side like that, and that's good. And I'll just have you spin a little bit and then go the opposite way. Yep, and that's good right there. Okay, and from this position, we'll have you bring your legs across. Okay, really good mobility there. And then leg across this way. Interesting thing she does, you won't see this with every patient, but when she comes across, so bring your leg across, this hip really drops down, and that's how she gets that full adduction. So, realize it's a combination of movements, right? I'm moving the hip and lumbar spine is flexing, and I'm seeing all this other stuff move at the same time. So don't trick yourself. My favorite is when people try and show you extension, so we'll go ahead and have you bring one leg back. Okay, and they do exactly that. Look at the extension she has, but it was really the rest of the spine that moved, okay? Yep, perfect, and then we'll have you do the opposite side. Okay, super good. And then internal, external rotation. I like to do the standing because you can just watch the feet, turn your foot all the way out, okay, and then back to neutral, and then all the way in. Okay, and that'll be active range of motion. Now we'll go ahead and get into palpation. We'll go ahead and have you lay supine, all right? 
So this is a point where you have to be very clear with your patient because you are going to be palpating fairly close to the genital region. You want to make sure the person is clear on what you're doing. Now, she's, I don't, she's obviously not a man. So the key thing here, if it's a male that you're palpating, you can actually ask them to just take their hand and move their, move their privates over to one side or to another side. So you can avoid contact that way. If you want, as a woman, what you can have them do is just say, hey, can you just landmark the outside, the, just the outside in this region right here? And then you know that that's kind of your boundary to work from. Either one of those are fine. You just want to avoid the incidental contact. Realistically, I mean, especially for women, I haven't had an issue at all doing palpation in this area, just as long as you're clear. Even the landmarking where somebody blocks off like this can make it a little bit awkward. So it's up to you and the rapport you have with that patient and how they, how they feel about it. But make sure that you have that permission to palpate before you proceed so there's no misconstrued um, idea of what's going on here, okay? The issue with the hip for palpation is most of the structures are deep and you can't reach them, all right? You can reach them later on indirectly with your special tests and orthopedic testing, but for right now, we're gonna start off with basic palpation. What's your goal? Give an anatomy lesson. There's a lot of very specific structures that run around in this area. So a couple of key things. First thing is, why not start with bony landmarks? Iliac crests, ASIS, follow that down. Inguinal ligament's gonna get you all the way to the pubic tubercle, right down to here. It's gonna take you down Femoral triangle in this region here, there might be swollen femoral lymph nodes. You might feel a femoral pulse, femoral vein is there. The femoral nerve runs through this area as well. You're checking the upper portion of the quads. TFL as you move out, sliding down over top of the vastus lateralis, vastus medialis, sartorius is across like this. All of this is being evaluated at the same time, okay? Remember for your basic evaluation, you wanna go from the top to the bottom, from the back to the front, and you wanna check areas that are, so if it's a hip pathology, I have to go back to the SI joint, I have to go down to the knee, I wanna evaluate the other corresponding areas in the region, okay? What else am I gonna do here? I'm probably gonna fade into passive range of motion. There's no point in having her change position. So from here for passive range of motion, where I always like to start my hip passive range of motion is with a straight leg raise. It's a fantastic orthopedic test. It also gives you good information as far as flexibility of the hamstrings, which is one of the major limiting factors for a lot of patients. So she gets up to right about here, and we can feel that hamstring tightness. Now I can feel it as resistance when I push, but I can also feel it when I palpate the muscle back there that there's a lot of tension into it, okay? So a passive straight leg raise to start. This is a hip joint exam, so what else I would do? I would flex the knee, get the hamstrings out of the picture, and now really check the full range of motion of the hip all the way up into flexion, okay? There's tests later on that you'll learn that are talking about iliopsoas tightness, like a Gainsland's test and things like that, where this comes up and this lifts up, but for right now, just go through the range of motion. So that's flexion. Also, what I'm gonna do from here is abduction and adduction. You'll take the leg out. Key thing you'll notice that I'm doing is I'm standing outside of the patient's legs. There's no reason for you to stand in the midline here. You're off to the side and you bring the person out. Now, Carly has pretty good flexibility into abduction, but I'm gonna take her to right about there. And all I'm looking for is this other side hip is starting to move and drop down once I get past this position right here, okay? So it's gonna be abduction, adduction. You're gonna go across the body like that. I might even anchor the ASIS just to keep her down and just across there. You have internal and external rotation. It's your option from this position you can just spin the leg out from there, and then spin the leg in from here. This is also known as a log roll test, because this is the log and you're rolling it back and forth. One issue I have with this type of assessment though is if she had any type of knee pathology and I put a lot of torque onto it, it could potentially be painful. So just be aware of that. Another variation that you can do for the rotational assessments is going to be from this position, you can check external rotation. Oh, just wait a minute, is this external rotation? Everybody gets tricked by that, okay? Even though the foot is going out, this is still internal rotation of the femur, okay? Internal rotation of the acetabulofemoral joint. And then you're gonna go ahead and check external rotation. Even though the foot's going midline, this is still external rotation and check that with a little bit of overpressure. You could also fade into working towards your muscle testing in this area. Extension, I usually wait and just do it when I have the patient lay on their side or lay prone. These, that extension motion is rarely limited and we'll do it in just a little bit. But for right now, we're gonna go into resisted muscle testing. So from this position here, what I usually like to do is be just above the knee, strong enough that I can work from that position right there. If you're a smaller practitioner, and as long as your patient doesn't have knee pain, then I would say you can go down over top of the ankles, especially as you get those bigger, stronger, more powerful patients. But for right now, what I'm gonna do is be on either side of the knees like this. I'm gonna try and pull your legs this way. Don't let me do it. Hold, 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 and relax. Okay, that's checking all of the adductors. I'm gonna try and squeeze your legs back together. Don't let me do it. Hold, 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 and relax. Little tip, the trick that I use so it's not all upper body strength, this elbow winds up inside my ASIS or inside of my thigh, so now I have my entire leg strength to go ahead and push that action, okay? Uh, so it's abduction, adduction. The next thing's gonna be flexion extension. 
I'm just going to hold your leg up just a little bit right there. And so what I'm going to try and do is lift you up. Don't let me do it, okay? Hold, 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 and relax. Key thing, I have to anchor her ASIS down, because if I don't, she's a strong person, so I'm going to do it again. She just, there's no way you can hold her, okay? So make sure you anchor for that. For the flexion, bring them up just a little bit. So you're going to hold that position here, and I'm going to try and push you down. Now I'm stabilizing the opposite side. Hold it, hold it, okay, and relax. That one is kind of tricky right there. If we didn't do the stabilization, go ahead and bring your leg back up. What would happen is she rolls over like this. So you want to stabilize and check that flexion out. Okay, so make sure you're stabilizing on both sides. Rotational movement, this one's kind of tricky. Now, you can do it with the leg straight, again, with no knee pathology. From here, I'm going to try and spin your leg that way. Don't let me do it. Okay, hold, hold, and relax. I'm going to try and spin your leg this way. Don't let me do it. Hold, hold, and relax. Okay. I haven't found that's giving me much clinical information that does tell me if there's weakness for sure. Myself, I prefer to do it up into this position here. And actually, Carla, get you a little bit closer to this edge of the table. Just basic body biomechanics, so you don't have to strain as a practitioner. Don't have a patient in the middle of a wide table where you really have to lean over top of them. It puts a lot more strain on your back. From this position, I like to take the ankle and put it next to my, just right over top of my hip, and then my elbow comes in here, and now I have two hands free. This is good for your basic assessment, but it's also going to be good later on when you start doing different treatments where you're pinning and stretching or trying to anchor a muscle and then actually go through and work through that muscle or if you're using any of the instruments or anything like that, okay? From this position, I can check flexion extension and rotation all at the same time, okay? Well, not all at the same time, hopefully, but you know what I mean, okay? So I'm going to try and pull your leg down like this. Don't let me do it. Hold, 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 and relax. What's the beautiful thing about this? All I have to do is just lean back with my body weight to do it, okay? For extension, you might actually want the patient to grab the side of the table just so they can hang on because a lot of people, and I know she's going to be strong enough that she would be able to resist this, I'm going to try and push up this way, don't let me do it. If she didn't grab on, what would happen is she would slide up the table, <coughs> good, okay, you're actually gripping, it's nice because this shirt makes you grip with your shoulder, so, okay. Alright, so that would be flexion and extension right there. For rotation, same thing. I'm not torquing across the knee because I don't want to put that extra force across the knee. I mean, if this was a jiu-jitsu match, maybe I do want to do something across the knee, but in this case, probably not, okay? What I'm going to be doing is putting more force over top and just take the soft tissue of the anterior thigh, spin it to the side, and I'm going to try and turn you this way. Don't let me do it, okay? So hold, hold, good, and relax. Same thing, opposite direction. I'm going to try and spin you this way. Don't let me do it. Hold, 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 and relax. So that would take you through your basic motor testing and you would check extension in that same position. Now, if you wanted to be really technical and detailed with extension, you'd have the patient flip over, but it creates an extra step that maybe would slow down your exam process a little bit. So from here, what I'm going to do is have you hold your leg up in that position right there. So I could do passive, sorry, just one second. I could do passive over pressure into extension as well, so as part of my passive range of motion. She maintains this position though, so just hold yourself there, Carly. And then I go ahead and release, and I'm going to try and push down. Don't let me move you. Hold, 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 and relax. Okay, so that's your other variation for that one as well. Uh, so history, inspection, palpation, motion, anything you want to add? The nice thing about doing the motion where you contact the leg with the knee bent is that you get to actually palpate the muscles involved versus distally, you don't really get that palpatory sense. Yeah, 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 so super good feedback on that one, okay? All right, uh, so then we're going to go into neurovascular screen. You've actually already done a little bit of it with your motor testing, okay? What else for neurovascular screen around the hip? So neuro for the lower extremity, you still want to check your deep tendon reflexes. That's going to be L4, L5, S1 on the Achilles, okay? And you'll want to compare those bilaterally. You can also check sensation for dermatomes. L1, L2, L3, L4, L5, S1 as you progress your way down the foot. Okay, and again, bilateral comparison. You could also do capillary refill for part of your vascular screen, okay? So vascular screen, if she was in shorts, you could take the, the skin anywhere, squeeze it, let it go, and watch the capillaries refill, or you can just take nail beds and squeeze those and look for capillary refill. Should be within two seconds that they return. The other general thing that you can find as you go through for palpation is temperature of the skin as you're evaluating, okay? Now this room is pretty cold, okay? You can see the goosebumps here, all right? So right there, that's a, that's a cold foot. Okay, and it's a cold room, so I'm not overly concerned about that, but if she came in with like Raynaud's type phenomenon or something like that, then that would be something I'd pay a little bit more attention to. Uh, what else for vascular? Other nice thing for vascular is you can check pulses as well. So you have that dorsal pedal pulse that you can check. You can go ahead from here and also check a posterior tibial pulse, popliteal pulse, and a femoral pulse in that femoral triangle as well. Again, for the femoral, especially the person has to be in a supine position or relaxed position. It's just too jammed up with all the tissues approximated in that area. Okay. 
Referred pain into the hip can be a little bit tricky, so things that can refer into the hip include things like the SI joint and lumbar spine, but as well, viscera can refer in that area as well. You can have kidneys or kidney stones that are being passed that can refer down into the groin region. You can have hernias, umbilical or femoral hernias that can be there as well. And just general visceral complaints can also potentially refer into the hip. Appendix? Yeah, appendix maybe. It's a little bit low for appendix, but yeah, it could potentially get down into this area, definitely. Yeah, okay. There can be ovarian cysts in rare cases, like deeper, deeper anatomy inside the pelvic bowl can refer their bladder issues, can potentially refer in their prostate in men, potentially has referral down into the hip, okay? All right, uh, that'll be referred pain and special tests. You're gonna pick your special tests based on your differential diagnosis list and the key conditions that you wanna rule in or rule out. Carly, I don't know if there's anything else you wanna add? No. No, okay, super good stuff and thank you for your time.